On the last episode of Built to Last, we marked our lot lines, installed our silt fence, and excavated. Today, it's time to start construction, and we'll begin by erecting our foundation. Support for Built to Last is provided by Unico Incorporated, manufacturers of the small duct high velocity HVAC Unico system. Unico is dedicated to the environment and has been serving residential and commercial customers around the corner and around the globe for more than 25 years. Great Northern Lumber, providing green construction materials from skyscrapers to residential remodel. Proud to serve you for the last 27 years and into the future in the lumber industry. Bosch, power tools for professionals. Proud sponsor of The Green Home. Florida Tile. Expect more. SPI Incorporated, protective coatings, proven performance, and real-world solutions for 24 years. Additional funding is provided by these firms. Conventional wisdom says to make any endeavor successful, you have to build on a solid foundation. And that's especially true for construction. Today, we'll be pouring our concrete foundation using new technologies that will make our home sound and efficient. Basically, this is the footing, which is the first step in the foundation. It's what they call a spread footing. Uh, two foot wide, one foot thick. Uh, just using two by 12s as a form, wood stakes. We need to uh, scrape out the greasy mud in the bottom. Um, water itself is easily pumped out and can be pushed by the concrete, but the mud needs to be scraped out as much as we can before we pour. The great formwork you see on site here is for the drain tile system and the rayon collection system. The PVC system is a two-fold product. It does do, do the footing formwork, so it alleviates doing additional framing because it also picks up the drain tile, footing form, and the rayon collection. Three bars just adding added reinforcement. Um, makes the concrete stronger. There's uh, three horizontals in, in the footing and vertical dowels, four foot on center on the short walls, one foot on center on the tall walls. We've got a basement area that walls will be close to 12 foot six high. The bricks are to keep the rebar up out of the mud basically and provide coverage so concrete gets all the way around the bar. Once the rebar is in place, it's fastened with wire to make sure it stays put when the concrete for the footings is poured. The concrete for our footings today is made up of Fly ash and cement. Fly ash is a byproduct of coal-fired power plants. It's the residue. It's a throwaway product. We use it as it's a filler instead of a Portland, and it's beneficial because it reduces the amount of water that's required and also takes the place of Portland cement. And it's a more workable product. It's less shrinkage and cracking, and it's easier to finish on site. So it's a very good product, very good uh, substitute for Portland. It helps the environment and also helps us to gain a lead point for the product.
Bruce, what's the plan for today? Today they'll be stripping the forms and the footings, getting ready for the foundation walls. Okay, and I see the guys are working in the pit already. Yeah, what they're doing is trying to get everything cleared out, get the area cleared so they can start staging for the ICX. They'll be starting to set that up probably tomorrow. Yeah, so we got quite a bit of rain yesterday, so is that why they're in there? Yeah, the rain has uh, delayed them a little bit. It's kind of a little bad to work in there today, but they're working their way through it. They'll get everything stripped, ready, and uh, set up for tomorrow. they got to get the footings, top of the footings cleared off so they can start snapping their lines, doing their calculations and measurements, and get the foundation wall set and squared away so we can move from there. And like you said, tomorrow the ICF forms are going Tomorrow the ICFs will be delivered on site. That's where we're trying to get everything cleared out of the way to give them the staging area so they can get started and start moving. We'll start with the back foundation wall and they'll work their way up to the front here. Very good. Looking forward to seeing it. There okay, we thanks. We'll see you then. Now that our footings are in place, we can begin building the walls of our foundation. The first step is to install the insulating concrete forms, or ICFs. They're one of the amazing products that will help make our home energy efficient. So let's get started and see how they work. My name is uh, Jerry Herdlicka. I'm here as a technical support for the insulated concrete forms, uh, ARCS insulated concrete forms. Uh, this morning, the gentlemen, before we actually lay block, are actually uh, snapping out lines, red lines, and then they actually put a sealer over the red line to keep the line so the weather doesn't take it away as, as time goes on, so we always have that re to uh, reference to. It's important that those measurements are taken correctly because there's building setback lines that we have to we, we have to hold that line. So that's why our red lines are snapped and then they're sealed for, for the, the longevity of the project. The insulated concrete forms are side, two sides of insulated uh, styrofoam and then there's a, a eight, on every eight inches there's a, a nailer that actually holds from front to back on a styrofoam form that actually makes up the insulated concrete form itself. On the blocks themselves, the ICF insulated concrete forms, they're not only between the black tabs, which are the nailers, but there's one inch increments in between that also. That you have to actually cut on the one inch increments to keep your black lines all in, all in a row. Once the, once the project is complete, you'll see that all of the black lines are in, 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 a, in a row and that helps for keeping everything straight, for drywalling, for nailing, for finding those black tabs for nailing or screwing to, whatever you need to do. Plus, when you're cutting on your one inch increments, if you stay on those, it will always keep everything in line. The actual insulated concrete forms, when they're stacked on top of each other, will also, yes, they will alternate so the seams are never right above each other. You always alternate those over 8 inches, 16 inches, uh, 16 inches to a minimum, just to keep the support of the block so there's no seams correctly over each other. The insulated concrete forms, when we put our first course down, we build the first course, we put the second course on that, that locks our wall together, pretty much. On top of the footing that our form will sit on, we actually take a, a uh, adhesive foam that actually holds the block to the footing. We use the adhesive to actually ad adhere the block to the footing, which then also holds the block in place. So when we build our, when we put our scaffolding up on the inside, it doesn't move for us on a little, you know, a little bit here and there. It's, it's actually we need that to stay in that on our red lines that are already snapped. John was also down there building actually. Um, uh, foundation pier pads. Those are actually for the inside of the house that would actually sit on the actual dirt itself where a beam or something like that from the inside uh, beams of the house will actually sit on. Most of the forms are standard, but specialty pieces like the brick ledge forms are utilized for specific purposes. A uh, brick ledge form is basically just what it says. There's a brick ledge on the form itself. So you can build up three or four courses, two, three, four, five courses, whatever you'd like, and then you can put a brick ledge form on there, which will actually work as a brick ledge for the brick uh, above it, and then you can go back to a, a regular form on top of that brick ledge, which just helps kind of, it's, 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 it's a concept of the green 
screen idea. It, uh, you don't have to pour that real thick wall all the way down to the footing. You can use that brick ledge where it's necessary and then you can go up from there. So if it's the savings of concrete, which is a green idea. The crew has been installing the ICFs for nearly a week now. It normally takes a week and a half to install them on a house this size, but that's in an ideal situation. Our guys have been fighting rain, mud, and wind, and they're still on schedule. As our team nears completion, they cut out rough openings where our basement windows will be and install a wood frame before finishing the ICF install. Today's the day we're pouring the foundation. The ICFs are all in place. Now we just need to fill them with concrete, which is easier said than done. To fill the forms, we're going to need about eight full trucks to complete the pour, which means we'll need about 80 total yards of concrete. These eight trucks hold a mixture that contains fly ash, which Bruce mentioned earlier. Since we're utilizing this product, it's important to know more about it and how it plays a role in our green home. Okay, Lorraine, could you please tell me what is fly ash? Fly ash is a byproduct of coal combustion. So basically, we found an opportunity to use it for this project in a really interesting way. And what is that? Well, we're using it instead of full cement. It's part of the recycled portion of our concrete. And believe it or not, I have a sample here. Ah, this is what fly yes. ash looks like. It looks just like sand. It's kind of like a flower-like consistency, kind of sand colored. But what it ends up doing is it strengthens the concrete over time, as opposed to conventional concrete that's made fully with cement. So what we're actually doing is we're replacing 30% of that cement with the fly ash. Oh, that's awesome. So it actually makes the concrete stronger. It does. And so what we end up doing is we end up using a product that would normally be waste and we've recycled it, we've helped the environment, we've increased the strength of our concrete walls, which of course will be much more durable and built to last. Ah, brilliant. Thank you so much for your expertise. Yeah, no problem. It's the end of the day and our foundation is finished. And the best part, we've recycled an industrial byproduct, received lean points for doing it, and have a stronger foundation too. After the concrete is poured into the ICFs, it's time to finish off the foundation. A waterproof membrane is installed on the outside of the ICFs to direct water away from the foundation. The stone base is brought on site to be used for the backfill base around the footings and drain tiles, as well as the base for the basement slab. Our concrete contractor then returns to pour the slab for the garage. With the foundation complete, our plumbers can begin their work for tying in the sewer lines and connecting to the city for water service. Now that our foundation is in place, it's time to get started on our heated basement floor. What's actually going on today is we're putting in the insulation, and this is one of the things that's really important about making sure that our slab is isolated from the ground, because ground temperature is typically in the 50s, and if you're trying to heat your home, what'll happen is that that heat is going to transfer, and so if you don't have insulation, all that heat that you've paid to create is just gonna basically go out the window. Today we're gonna to be prepping the basement floor slab. We've got our stone base down. We're putting down our vapor barrier and then we're installing uh, two inch rigid insulation. Spent about a day rough grading the stone here. We got the underground plumbing in place. So we're probably looking at a few hours to get the vapor barrier down and the rigid insulation down on a uh, house that's his footprint. The rigid insulation here is part of the lead criteria. It kind of gives us the thermal barrier for the whole basement slab and it gives us, it's part of the whole envelope system of the house. By doing the two inch rigid insulation, we get an R10 value for the floor slab. 
The consensus is that you know, two inches is, a, is about right. It's the minimum. This is an R10 underneath our slab here. There's like an optimum level with uh, insulation. A good analogy for, for the insulation that we're putting in today is kind of like the soles of your shoes. So when you go out on a, a, on a really cold day and you're walking around in your stocking feet because you're too lazy to put your slippers on to get the newspaper, basically, you know, that cold just transfers right through that sock. However, when you put your shoes on, you've got that good separation and uh, you're not going to lose all your heat through your feet. So that's what our insulation is. It's like the sole of your shoe. After the vapor barrier and rigid insulation are installed, our crew can place the welded wire fencing that will keep the pipe for our radiant system in place. Our pipe fitters arrive on the scene soon after the welded wire is complete and are ready to prep for the pipe installation. The heating system will be divided into zones to allow for energy efficiency. So the first thing they have to do is mark out the zone lines. Since this technology is a new concept to many people, our heating expert wanted to teach us about the system. I'm here with Joe Pearson from JP Heating. He's going to tell us a little bit about radiant heat. Joe, what is radiant heat? Radiant heat is where we take a, a boiler, in this case a high efficient boiler, and we heat water and we put it through tubes and we put those tubes inside the, the concrete cement. And, and that transfers that heat into the slab, which makes it very comfortable. Now, what are some of the benefits of radiant heat? It's very efficient. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, very comfortable. Uh, in this case, we, have, we can zone it in, in many different fashions because of the system that we're using. And it also makes a, a, an area like this, where it's a basement, more livable, more comfortable, you wouldn't be afraid to send your kids downstairs uh, to, to play. Or if you had a ball game to watch, it would just make it a lot more comfortable for the homeowner. Joe, I'm so excited to see this work get started. Thank you. Thank you. Now that our plans are laid out and our zones are marked, it's time to install the tubing for the radiant heat system, which will be using over 2,000 feet of tubing. While the pipe fitters lay out the system, our architect gets a chance to review the manifold system with Joe, who is supervising the day's work. This thing here, these are all flow controls. These are telling what the flow is on it. And, and these are manual. Without the, uh, without the zone valves, these are just manual okay. controls where we as we tighten it, we open up the valve more, add more pressure. Now, when you pressurize it, will you know immediately if it's there's yeah. a leak someplace, or is there well, more of a time frame? Or? It, it, we, well, if it's a major leak, we'll know immediately. <laughs> if it's uh, a slow leak, probably, in my experience, it, it may show up the day of the pour. Uh, it's probably very important to just check the gauge again, just to see if, if there's still air in the system. Sure. If they come, come back two, three days later and there's no air in it, you know, you might want to look over it again. But this tubing is very, very tough and durable. If there's a problem, it's probably not in the tubing. It may be in the fittings. Maybe something isn't tight up, tightened up enough or, or anything like that. Our radiant flooring has been set in place and we've put the tubes under pressure for a couple days to make sure there were no leaks in the system. And once all that's been finalized and approved by our plumbing contractor, we can make sure we can be ready to pour the floor. So the next step will be to pour the floor. There's a couple of precautions we have to be make. Uh, we gotta be careful of the equipment we bring the concrete in on. 
because we don't want to be crushing any of the tubes or any of the things that are in place in the floor. So it's a tedious process and it's hard to do, but we'll get it taken care of soon. One of the challenges we had being a, a tight site condition that we are and the slope site was we were, one of the issues was getting concrete into the foundation and to the big basement slab. So one of the things we had to do is bring in a pumper truck because our limitations of how far we can run the stuff with the chute as well as trying to buggy it down the hill would have been too much. So we decided to go with a pumper truck and that was the best route to go and it's a challenging process that in itself. A lot of coordination needs to take place a lot of it's done through radio communications because we are a split level site, so just access to driver to see what's going on, trying to boom it into place. In addition to the radio communications, there's a number of guys on site just to continue to work all through. Uh, we have vibrators in place to kind of make sure that we're not getting air, any air entrapment in concrete. And the finishers are on site, so we got to get this thing poured. we got a large basement area, so everything has to be coordinated. A number of guys are in place to make sure everything's done right. It's easy to tell that the installers pouring our basement floor are masters of their trade. Time plays a role in the quality of the product, and every member of the team performs in sync with each other to ensure that this floor looks great and is up to our standards. Now with this phase of the process complete, Laureen can see where we are in reaching our green home goals. Looks like we're off to a good start. We've achieved a couple of our credits already under integrated project planning. Now, our durability management process that's going to be going throughout the project, but I know for a fact we can check off a couple things already, such as the drainage around the foundation. We've put in a continuous drainage tile around the perimeter, as well as we've waterproofed the foundation. We've put vapor barrier under the slab, and interestingly enough, that vapor barrier is tied in with our radon mitigation system that's a part of another credit, which I'm pretty sure that we're going to get. As far as preferred locations, Definitely we should be able to get the edge development. Infrastructure, definitely, we're reusing our water and sewer lines, and so instead of having to spend extra money to put in an entirely new system, we just tap into what's here. We also will have access to open space, so we should get that point. And then as far as site stewardship, we've got our erosion controls in place, our silt fencing's in place, trees are protected, we should be able to meet that prereq, no problem. Then as far as non-toxic pest control, because we're using a solid concrete foundation, we should be able to get that, one of those strategies, just because, again, a solid concrete foundation isn't as uh, enticing to a termite as, say, wood would be. And what else do we have here? Looks like we should be able to take some things off the list in the thermal bypass checklist. We really only need to have uh, 15 slash 19 for the basement insulation, our value, but we're actually at our 26 because we've got ICFs. And lastly, it looks like we've got our education, one of our education credits moving along. We've got the strategy of the signage in place to help educate people that we're going to be building a, or that we are building a certified green home. So other than that, I, I think as long as we continue to follow the checklist and meet our prereqs, we should be certified no problem. a great start with the foundation and basement slab in place. Next time on Built to Last, we'll begin building up as we start framing our home. See you then. Visit the Built to Last website to learn about these topics and more.
Support for Built to Last is provided by... Unico Incorporated, manufacturers of the small duct high velocity HVAC Unico system. Unico is dedicated to the environment and has been serving residential and commercial customers around the corner and around the globe for more than 25 years. Great Northern Lumber, providing green construction materials from skyscrapers to residential remodel. Proud to serve you for the last 27 years and into the future in the lumber industry. Bosch, power tools for professionals. Proud sponsor of The Green Home. Florida Tile, expect more. SPI Incorporated, protective coatings, proven performance, and real world solutions for 24 years. Additional funding is provided by these firms.